When and where did the connection between mountain landscapes and the human mind begin? Were mountains just barriers to overcome? Or are they somehow part of our being human? In this presentation, Living Landscapes in Ice Age Art, we will look into the Paleoithic mind that I believe to be our own, so as to answer these questions and perhaps find early connections between mountain landscapes and modern man on the European continent. First, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this year's the International Association of Landscape Archaeology Conference. My name is Bernie Taylor, and my work explores mankind's creative and intellectual origins through Ice Age art. The representation of landscapes in art is not a modern idea. Landscapes such as this Bronze Age fresco, unearthed from the volcanic ash of Santorini, have been dated to at least the last few millennia. These landscape scenes may not be just pictures to replace the less than magnificent views through our windows. There could be a deeper connection. The Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Jung found that the most common non-organic characters in dreams were a body of water and a mountain. Jung believed that they are archetypal and structure our dreams. Psychoanalyst asks, do we have dreams or do the dreams have us? Let's travel to northern Spain, where we can test a mountain landscape psychology hypothesis further back in time than the Bronze Age Santorini image. We are here at the mountain Chindoki, whose peak is about 1,300 meters. My pronunciation of Basque names are not likely correct, but they are spelt correctly in this presentation. Chindoki is sacred among the Basque people who have inhabited this region since at least the Neolithic. The origins of the Basque are an enigma, as many believe that their language is not strongly connected to any other European language groups. The Basque believe that their mother nature deity, Mary, seasonally dwells in Mary Zulo, a cave on Chindoki. Mary Zulo literally means Mary's cave. One can see the climbing route to Mary Zulo with the cave marked by the blue arrow. This cave is on the other side of Chindoki that we viewed in the previous slide. The Basque historically coexisted with mountains, which are the foundation of their creation mythology. Chindoki is one of their most important mountains. This image of Chindoki, as marked with the red arrow, was taken from the position indicated by the yellow arrow. The photographer has a westerly view of Chindoki. We will return to the face of Chindoki shortly. We travel now to the El Pindal cave in nearby Asturias, Spain. The current walking time between the El Pindal Cave and Chindoki is about 55 hours, covering 262 kilometers. Google Maps uses 5 kilometers per hour to calculate walk times. In the El Pindal Cave, there is the principal panel, which has red markings, engraved lines, and interesting natural irregularities. Most of the cave panels in this presentation were taken by esteemed Japanese photographer Takio Fukawa. They can be accessed from him at www.texni.co.jp. We can break the principal panel into some of its elements and find recognizable natural features from Chindoki. Those features on both have the appearance of a straight-tusked elephant with lower tusks and trunk. The mountain is living in an animistic sense of the world. On the El Pindal cave wall, there is a rough feature in gold as marked by the blue arrow that appears to be a natural irregularity and possibly what drew the Ice Age artists to work the face of this panel. Earlier, I noted that the current walking time between the El Pindal Cave and Chindoki is about 55 hours. There is a lot of cave wall space much closer to Chindoki than a 55-hour walk. This cave was intentionally chosen. When we widen our view of the panel, the head of an unusual character emerges from behind the elephant. A green arrow marks the right side of the bean's head. The character comes from over and behind the mountain and elephant. The flow of this representation that may be snaking through the red dashes area painted by the Ice Age artists are indicated by the blue arrows. This character has the impression of the wind and may extend to the peak of the depicted mountain. The wind-like character is not part of the mountain. I believe that this character is a representation of the Basque spirit Odai, who is the spirit of thunder 
and the personification of storm clouds. Odai is an agent of Mary. The weather spirit appears to be emerged from the side of Mary's cave. When the mountain archetype is encountered, the story is evoked. The straight-tusked elephant may be another Basque mythological character. In Basque tradition, Mary transforms into other characters, such as the shapeshifter Red Bull bovine they call Ate, to do their bidding. Ate is believed to be a cave-dwelling spirit. After the Ice Age, when the elephants and woolly mammoths left Europe, the Basque may have substituted the horned bovine for the tusked elephant. They may be both bulls, just not bulls of the same species. In this case, we have a red-spotted elephant, reinforcing the Basque connection. The gold-colored natural irregularity extends from above the Chindoki elephant, as indicated by the blue arrow. There is the impression of a second and larger elephant above. Such an elephant would be partly above the mountain. I believe these two elephants are characters in a lost myth. The principal panel is wild to say the least. There are more lines and curved surfaces to explore and possible connections to be made. Now let's turn our attention to another upper Paleolithic cave. We travel from Tindoki to the Las Monitas Cave in Cantabria, Spain. Las Monitas is in the El Castillo Mountain that has a cave of the same name, among others. The current walking time between Chindoki and the Las Monitas Cave is about 44 hours. In the Las Monitas Cave, there is the panel of masks that appears to be as enigmatic as the El Pindal principal panel. On the panel of masks, we find the Paradolia elephant character visualized on Chindoki and both of the same as depicted at the El Pindal Cave. The peak of the smaller elephant's head is marked by the red arrows, and the blue arrow indicates the head of the larger elephant in shadow. The smaller elephant had previously been identified as a mammoth. We have now established collaborative links between the Basque characters depicted on the walls of two upper Paleolithic caves and a still sacred mountain in the region. We also find the wind character Odai, who comes from behind the mountain. There is also a Therianthrope, the mix of human and other animal being in the center. He has foxish ears and peers through a magical mask. One might consider his ears to be elven in today's mythological vernacular. A second mask facing down is to the viewer's far right. This panel was previously titled the Panel of Masks, based on the mask in the center and the impression of the mask among the surrounding dark lines. The Odi and Foxish-eared characters appear to be new finds. Had these spiritual characters been refound in modern times, but were too controversial to discuss? Or was the data to more fully analyze these images not previously available? I sometimes scratch my head with these questions. Those dark lines over Odai's outstretched right arm are flora, such as winged broom, marked by the red arrows, a large brown maple leaf as indicated by the blue arrows and a scattering of Spanish junipers that appear to be blowing in the wind. One can sense a gust of air animating the flora. This panel has the appearance of a late summer scene, perhaps in the evening or just before sunrise when the colors of the flora cannot be seen. Still, this scene is not of reality. The characters suggest we are looking into the mythical imagination, which the psychologist Jung believed is projected from the same archetypes that structure our dreams. In continuing our investigation of the mountain landscape Paradolia cave art hypothesis, we journey to Pica Penmeniera, that is in Asturias, Spain. Pica Penmeniera is a fairly low mountain at 763 meters, but has a lot of character. Regional mountaineers refer to this peak as the Little Matterhorn, based on some art geometry with the Matterhorn of the Alps. There is a rounded hill to the viewer's left, known as Pendendo. The photo of Pica Penmeniera in the previous image, as marked here with the red arrow, was taken near to Alice, indicated by the yellow arrow. The photographer had an easterly view of Pica Penmeniera. We may learn more about how Ice Age peoples view Pica Penmeniera at the Las Chimeneas Cave in Monte El Castillo, that is about a 14 hour walk. Pica Penmeniera has some resemblance to a panel in the hall of the paintings at Los Chimeneas Cave. I've taken the liberty to name this scene the Panel of the Bears, 
in the absence of any known name. Can you see the bears? Our eyes may have been initially drawn to the strong black lines on the panel, but if we pull our gaze away from them, an archetypal protective mother bear with at least one cub on her head emerges in relief. We today use the term mother bear to describe protective human mothers. The mother bear's forelegs are stationary. She appears to be searching for something. Below the she-bear is an alpine cho, a bird common in the region, which looks up at her. The bears in dark lines appear to resemble pica penmeniera and the lower pendendo in the foreground. The she-bear has a touch of white on her muzzle, which may represent snow and the white of the mountain. We can see a stronger resemblance with this close-up shot of the mountain, even features for the bear cub blob on her head. Yet the she-bear seems to be coming out of the mountain as if she is part of the geological formation and the sky at the same time. We may be able to find more answers to this arrangement of bears and mountains through these two panels in the Las Monitas Cave and the Cueva de Venta de la Pera. Both are a long two days walk from Pica Penmeniera. I have also named each of these the Panel of the Bears in the apparent absence of other names. Can you count the bears? We find an archetypal mother again with at least one cub below her. She appears to be protectively pushing back hyenas that have their teeth clamped down on something. Strong dark lines are in front and behind her. Let's look closer at the head of the mother bear whose muzzle can be found with the blue arrow. She has a touch of white on her muzzle, which may represent the snow theme and the white section of the mountain as we found in the Las Chimeneas mother bear. See her clawed and raised right paw on the back of a hyena, indicated by the red arrow, and the tucked under left paw with the yellow one. The she-bear is emerging from Pica Penmeniera, and the hyenas are formed from the lower pendendo. The dark line shape the mountains as we found in Las Chimeneas. The mountains would appear to be living beings from an animistic perspective. We find our mother bear again at Cueva de Venta de la Pera in a similar posture to the Las Chimeneas bear. She has two identifiable bear cubs on her back in this image. The she-bear's muzzle has a touch of white to represent snow and perhaps the white face of the mountain. We do not see the strong black lines for Pica Penmeniera and Pendendo as we did in the Las Chimeneas and Las Monitas bear panels. Still, there is a natural irregularity on the cave wall as marked with the red arrow that resembles the top section of Pica Penmeniera, with the bear's head sticking out as indicated by the yellow arrow. There are objects in the protective mother bear's mouth. To the viewer's lower right are the open ends of two different bones from unknown animals, as marked with the blue and yellow arrows. The bone in yellow is a broken foreleg condyles. The frozen head of a different animal, the European wolverine, is indicated by the red arrow. Out of the right side of her muzzle is brown material that I haven't identified. She appears to have scooped up these frozen foods, reinforcing the seasonality to be winter. This is an incredible scene. We have viewed many amazing mountain landscape images of both the cave underworld and terrestrial plain in this presentation that were part of our awareness near to 27,000 years ago. The depicted animals were one with the biological geological, and possibly psychological landscapes. We continue to connect with mountain landscapes. We climb mountains without apparent gain, sing about them in our songs, and mythologize our encounters with the great beyond on their lofty summits. When the mountain archetype is encountered, the story is evoked. As a species, we remain animus, at one with the landscape, in the Paleolithic mind that is still our own. The living landscape narrative does not end at the intersection of the cave underworld and the terrestrial plane. In the upper Paleolithic tradition, connections were made to skyscapes, as well, which in synchrony then would be a cosmoscape. We do not have time to cover cosmoscapes today. Cosmoscape connections for these and other cave images can be found in presentations on my webpage. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak at this year's conference. More of my work can be found on these sites. I'm always open to cooperate on projects and virtually present my research to community and academic audiences.